When he got on a plane in Portland, Oregon last night, he was just another passenger who gave his name as D.A. Cooper. But today, after hijacking a Northwest Airlines jet, ransoming the passengers in Seattle, then making a getaway by parachute somewhere between there and Reno, Nevada, the description on one wire service, master criminal. And carrying a plane briefcase, which he told the crew held explosives. Authorities began their search here, thinking the hijacker may have jumped off at the end of the runway as the plane touched down. People thought he landed on the west side of the range, but his money was found to be on the east side. It took three and a half hours, slow for a jet, but the hijacker had given detailed flight instructions. It was a cold and wet day on November 24th, 1971 in Portland, Oregon. The day before Thanksgiving, the airport had been busy with travelers. A man carrying a black case approached the flight counter of Northwest Orient Airlines. The company is no longer in operation, but more recently, it was known as Northwest Airlines. The man wanted to purchase a ticket to the Seattle Tacoma International Airport. A flight from Portland to Seattle was only 30 minutes. The man bought the ticket using cash. He gave the name Dan Cooper. That is the name that was listed on his ticket. Eyewitnesses described the man as a white male in his mid-40s with dark hair and brown eyes. He was wearing a black or brown business suit, a white shirt, a thin black tie, a black raincoat, and brown shoes. He was carrying a black briefcase and a brown paper bag. The man waited to board flight 305, a Boeing 727, registration number N467US. Dan Cooper took a seat in 18E in the last row. Because of the short 30 minute flight, there was not a long time for flight attendants to give drinks before they had to prepare for landing. Dan Cooper ordered a bourbon and 7-up. Flight 305 consisted of a crew of six, Captain William A. Scott, First Officer William Bill Radax, Flight Engineer Harold E. Anderson, and Flight Attendants Alice Hancock, Tina Mucklow, and Florence Schaffner. With 37 passengers on board, Flight 305 left Portland on schedule at 2.50 Pacific Standard Time. Shortly after takeoff, Dan Cooper leaned back and handed Flight Attendant Florence Schaffner a note. She was sitting in her jump seat directly behind Cooper. She assumed the note she was handed by Cooper was the man's phone number. She had been repeatedly hit on by men during her time as a flight attendant. Florence dropped the note inside her purse. She did not read it. Cooper saw this. He leaned back and whispered, Miss, you better look at that note. I have a bomb. Florence opened the note. It was written with felt pen in all capital letters. Cooper had written, Miss, I have a bomb in my briefcase and want you to sit by me. She returned the note to Cooper and sat down next to him. She turned and quietly asked to see the bomb. He opened up his briefcase. She witnessed two rows of four red cylinders which she assumed was dynamite. Attached to the cylinders were wires with large cylindrical batteries. Cooper closed the briefcase and told Florence his demands. She wrote the demands down on a piece of paper and brought it to the cockpit. She informed the flight crew of the situation. Captain Scott told her to remain in the cockpit for the remainder of the flight and to take notes on the events as they unfolded. The captain contacted Northwest Orient Flight Operations in Minnesota. He relayed the hijacker's demands. $200,000 and a knapsack by 5 p.m. He wanted two front parachutes and two back parachutes. By requesting two sets of parachutes, Cooper implied that he planned to take a hostage with him, thereby discouraging the authorities from supplying a non-functional parachute. With Schaffner in the cockpit, Mucklow sat next to Cooper to act as a liaison between him and the flight crew in the cockpit. After the flight reached Seattle, Cooper made more demands. The fuel trucks must meet the plane and all passengers must remain seated while she brought the money on board. He would release the passengers after he had the money. The last items to be brought on board would be the four parachutes. Captain Scott informed Seattle Tacoma Airport of the situation. They contacted local police and the FBI. The passengers were told their arrival in Seattle would be delayed because of minor mechanical difficulty. Donald Nyrop authorized payment of the ransom and ordered all the employees to cooperate with the hijacker and comply with his demands. 
For around two hours, Flight 305 circled Puget Sound to give Seattle police and the FBI sufficient time to assemble Cooper's money, parachutes, and mobilize emergency units. During the flight from Portland to Seattle, Cooper demanded that Mucklow remain by his side at all times. She later said that he appeared familiar with the local terrain. While he was looking out the window, he remarked it looked like Tacoma down there as the aircraft flew above. He also correctly spotted McCord Air Force Base, which was only a 20-minute drive from Seattle Tacoma Airport. She described Cooper's demeanor, saying that he was not nervous. He seemed rather nice, and he was not cruel or nasty. Mucklow chatted with Cooper while the plane circled Seattle and asked why he picked Northwest Airlines to hijack. He laughed and replied, It's not because I have a grudge against your airlines. It's just because I have a grudge. He then explained that this flight simply suited his needs. He asked where she was from and she told him she was originally from Pennsylvania but was living in Minneapolis. He responded that Minnesota was a very nice country. She asked where he was from but he became upset and refused to answer. He asked if she smoked and offered her a cigarette. She told him that she quit, but she accepted the cigarette anyway. The FBI records indicate Cooper briefly spoke to an unidentified passenger while the plane maintained its holding pattern over Seattle. In his interview with the FBI, George Labasonnery said Cooper was initially amused by the interaction, then became irritated and told the man to return to his seat, but the cowboy ignored Cooper and continued to question her. Labasanier claimed he eventually persuaded the cowboy to return to his seat. Mucklow's version of the interaction deferred from Labasanier's. She said a passenger approached her and asked for a sports magazine to read because he was bored. She and the passenger moved to an area directly behind Cooper, where the passenger and she looked for a magazine. The passenger took a copy of the New Yorker and returned to his seat. When Mucklow returned to sit with Cooper, he said, if that is a sky marshal, I don't want any more of that. The man was never identified. The $200,000 ransom was received from Seattle First National Bank in a bag weighing approximately 19 pounds. The money, 10,000 unmarked $20 bills, most of which had serial numbers beginning with L, indicating insurance by the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. It was photographed on microfilm by the FBI. Seattle police obtained the two front parachutes from a local skydiving school and the two back main parachutes from the local stump pilot. Around 5.24 p.m., Captain Scott was informed the parachutes had been delivered to the airport and he notified Cooper that he would be landing soon. At 5.46 p.m., Flight 305 landed at Seattle Tacoma Airport. With Cooper's permission, Captain Scott parked the aircraft on a partially lit runway away from the main terminal. Cooper demanded that only one representative of the airline approach the plane with the parachutes and the money. The only entrance and exit would be through the aircraft's front door via the mobile air stairs. Operations manager Al Lee was designated to be the courier. Lee did not want Cooper to mistake his airline uniform for that of a law enforcement officer's uniform, so he changed into a civilian clothes for the task at hand. With all the passengers remaining seated, a ground crew attached the mobile staircase per Cooper's direction. Mucklow exited the aircraft through the front door and retrieved the ransom money. When she returned, she carried the money back past the seated passengers to Cooper in the last row. After Cooper received the money, he agreed to release the passengers. As they departed, Cooper inspected the money. In an attempt to relieve tension, Mucklow jokingly asked Cooper if she could have some of the money. She said that Cooper had tried to tip her and her other two flight attendants earlier in the flight with money from his own pocket but they each declined, citing this policy. After the passengers have safely departed, this left only Cooper and the six crew members on board. Mucklow made three trips outside the aircraft to retrieve the parachutes. Schaffner asked Cooper if she could retrieve her purse stored in the compartment behind his seat. He agreed and told her, I won't bite you. Flight attendant Hancock then asked Cooper if the flight attendants could leave, to which Cooper replied, whatever you girls would like. So Hancock and Schaffner departed. When Mucklow brought him the final parachute, she gave him printed instructions on how to use them, but Cooper said he did not need them. A problem with refueling the airplane caused a delay. 
so the second truck and then a third were brought into the aircraft to complete the fueling process. During the delay, Mucklow said Cooper complained. The money was delivered in a cloth bag instead of a knapsack, as he had directed, and now he had to improvise a new way to transport the money. He used his pocket knife. Cooper cut the canopy from one of the reserve parachutes and stuffed the money into an empty parachute bag. An FFA official requested a face-to-face -face meeting with Cooper aboard the aircraft, but Cooper denied this. Cooper became impatient, saying, This shouldn't take so long and let's get this show on the road. He then gave the cockpit crew his flight plan and detectives southeast towards Mexico City at minimum airspeed possible without stalling the aircraft. Approximately 100 knots, 115 miles per hour, at a maximum 10,000 foot altitude. Cooper also specified the landing gear must remain deployed. The wing flaps must be lowered to 15 degrees and the cabin must remain unpressurized. First Officer Radask informed Cooper that the configuration limited the aircraft's range to about a thousand miles, so a second refueling would be necessary before entering Mexico. Cooper and the crew discussed options and agreed on Reno Tahoe International Airport as the refueling stop. Cooper further directed the aircraft to take off with the rear exit door open and its air stair extended. The Northwest Home Office objected to this saying it was unsafe. Cooper countered saying it can be done, do it. But he agreed not to argue the point and said he would lower the staircase once they were airborne. He demanded Mucklow remain on board to assist this operation. Around 7.40 p.m., Flight 305 took off with only Cooper, Mucklow, Captain Scott, First Officer Radask, and Flight Engineer Anderson on board. Two F-16 fighters from McCord Air Force Base and a Lockheed T-33 trainer diverted from an unrelated Air Force National Guard mission followed the 727. All three jets maintained flight patterns to stay behind the slow-moving 727 and out of Cooper's view. After takeoff, Cooper told Mucklow to lower the aft staircase. She told him and the flight crew she feared being sucked out of the aircraft. The flight crew suggested she come to the cockpit and retrieve an emergency rope, which she could tie to herself and to a seat. Cooper rejected the suggestion, stating he did not want her to go to the front or the flight crew to come back to the cabin. She continued to express her fears to him and asked him to cut some cord from one of the parachutes to create a safety line for her. He said he would lower the stairs himself and instructed her to go to the cockpit, close the curtain partition between the coach and first class sections and not to return. Before she left, she begged Cooper, please, please take the bomb with you. Cooper responded he would either disarm it or take it with him. As she walked to the cockpit and turned to close the curtain partition, she saw Cooper standing in the aisle, tying what appeared to be the money bag around his waist. From takeoff to when Mucklow entered the cockpit, four to five minutes had elapsed. For the rest of the flight to Reno, Mucklow remained in the cockpit and was the last person to see Cooper. Around 8 p.m., a cockpit warning light flashed, indicating the aft staircase had been lowered. The pilot used the cabin intercom to ask Cooper if he needed assistance. Cooper's last message was no. The flight crew's ears popped from the drop in cabin air pressure from the stairs being opened. At approximately 8.13 p.m., the aircraft's tail section suddenly pitched upwards, forcing the pilots to trim and return the aircraft to level flight. In his interview with the FBI, the co-pilot said the sudden upward pitch occurred while the flight was near the suburbs north of Portland. With the aft cabin door open and the staircase deployed, the flight crew remained in the cockpit. Not sure if Cooper was still on board. Mucklow used the cabin intercom to inform Cooper that they were approaching Reno and he needed to raise the stairs so the plane could land safely. She repeated her request as the pilots made the final approach to land, but neither Mucklow or the flight crew received a reply from Cooper. At 11.02 p.m., the aft staircase still deployed, Flight 305 landed at Reno Tahoe International Airport. FBI agents, state troopers, sheriff's deputies, and Reno police established a perimeter around the aircraft, but feared that the hijacker and the bomb were still on board. They did not approach the plane. Captain Scott searched the plane and confirmed that Cooper was no longer on board. And after a 30 minute search, 
An FBI bomb squad declared the cabin safe. 36 passengers got off the jetliner in Seattle last night, left aboard four crew members and the hijacker, dressed in a business suit demanding $200,000 and carrying a plane briefcase which he told the crew held explosives. With the full ransom collected from Seattle banks and four parachutes aboard, the plane headed for Reno. It took three and a half hours, slow for a jet, but the hijacker had given detailed flight instructions. The rear stairwell was open all the way. It arrived at Reno in shreds. The investigation. In addition to 66 fingerprints aboard the airliner, the FBI agents recovered Cooper's black clip-on tie, tie clip, and two of the four parachutes, one of which had been opened and three shroud lines cut from the canopy. FBI agents interviewed eyewitnesses in Portland, Seattle, and Reno. They developed a series of composite sketches. Local police and the FBI agents immediately began questioning possible suspects, acting on the possibility the hijacker may have used his real name or the same alias in a previous crime. Portland police discovered and interviewed a Portland citizen named D.B. Cooper. The Portland Cooper had a minor police record, but was quickly eliminated as a suspect. Reporter James Long was in a rush to make a deadline and he confused the man's name with the name of the hijacker and other news media sources repeated the error so the hijacker Dan Cooper became known as D.B. Cooper a innocent man from Portland due to the number of different parameters and variables getting a precise area to search was difficult the jet's airspeed varied the environmental conditions along the flight path varied with the aircraft's location and altitude, and only Cooper knew how long he stayed in free fall before pulling the ripcord. The Air Force F-16 pilots never saw anyone jump from the back of the airliner, nor did radar detect any deployed parachute. Even if the planes were close enough to the jet, it would be extremely difficult to spot a man dressed in black jumping into the moonless wet night. The T-33 pilots did not make any contact with the 727. On December 6, 1971, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover approved the use of an Air Force SR-71 Blackbird to retrace and photograph Flight 305's path. In an attempt to locate the items Cooper carried during his flight, the SR-71 made five flights to retrace Flight 305's route. But due to poor visibility, the photography attempts were unsuccessful. In an experimental recreation, flying the same aircraft used by the hijacking and the same flight configuration, FBI agents pushed a 200-pound sledge out of the open air stair and were able to reproduce the upward motion of the tail section and brief change in cabin pressure described by the flight crew at 8.13 p.m. Initially, Cooper's landing zone was determined to be within the area on the southernmost outreach of Mount St. Helens, a few miles southeast of Ariel, Washington, near Lake Merwin. Search areas focused on Clark and Cohert counties, encompassing the terrain immediately south and north of the Lewis River in the southwest Washington area. FBI agents and sheriff's deputies searched large areas of the heavily watered terrain on foot and by helicopter. Door-to-door -door searches of local farm homes were also carried out. Search parties ran patrol boats along the Lake Merwin and Lake Yale areas. The reservoir immediately to its east. Neither Cooper nor any of the equipment he presumably carried was found. Aircrafts and helicopters from the Oregon Army National Guard. The FBI coordinated an aerial search along the entire flight path known as Vector 23. From Seattle to Reno, numerous broken treetops were seen and several pieces of plastic and other objects resembling parachute canopies were sighted and investigated, but nothing relevant to the hijacking was found. After winter in 1972, teams of FBI aided by 200 soldiers from Fort Lewis, along with the United States Air Force, Air National Guard, and civilian volunteers conducted another thorough ground search of Clark and Colwitz counties for 18 days in March. A month later, another 18 days search was conducted. A marine salvage team used a submarine to search the 200-foot depths of Lake Merwin. 
Two local women found a skeleton in an abandoned structure in Clark County. It was later identified as the remains of Barbara Ann Derry, a teenager who had been abducted and murdered several weeks before. Unfortunately, the extensive searches and recovery operations, no significant material related to the hijacking was found. Based on early computer projections produced for the FBI, Cooper's drop zone was first estimated to be between the aerial dam and north of the town of Battleground, Washington to the south. The FBI concluded their original calculations were incorrect after a joint investigation with the Northwest Orient Airlines and the Air Force determined Cooper probably jumped out over the town of La Center. In 2019, the FBI released a report indicating that about three hours after Cooper jumped, a burglary was reported in a small grocery store near Hessen, Washington, a town near the calculated drop zone. The burglar was noted by the FBI to have taken only survival items such as beef jerky and gloves. Shortly after the hijacking, the FBI distributed lists of the ransom serial numbers to financial institutions, casinos, racetracks, and other businesses that routinely conducted large cash transactions, also to law enforcement agencies around the world. Northwest Oregon offered a reward of 15% of the recovered money to a maximum $25,000. In early 1972, the serial numbers were released to the general public. Two men used counterfeit $20 bills printed with Cooper's serial numbers to swindle $30,000 from Newsweek reporter Carl Fleming. In exchange for an interview with a the man, they falsely claimed to be the hijacker. Later analysis indicates that the original landing zone was inaccurate. Captain Scott, who was flying the aircraft manually because of Cooper's speed and altitude demands, later determined his flight path was farther east than he initially thought. Additional data in particular, Continental Airlines pilot Tom Bowens, who was flying four minutes behind Flight 305, indicated the wind direction factored into the drop zone calculations had been wrong, possible by as much as 80 degrees. This and other data suggest that the drop zone was south-southeast of the original estimate in the drainage area of the Washigal River. FBI agent Ralph Hemsback wrote, I have to confess, if I were going to look for Cooper, I would head for the Washigal. Investigators have speculated that the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens could have obliterated any remaining physical clues. The Physical Evidence FBI agents found a black clip-on tie in seat 18E. Attached to the tie was a gold clip with a circular mother-of-pearl setting in the center of the clip. The FBI demonstrated that the tie had been sold exclusively at J.C. Penney department stores, but was discontinued in 1968. In 2007, the FBI had built a partial DNA profile from samples found on Cooper's tie. However, the FBI acknowledged no evidence linked Cooper to the source of the DNA sample. The FBI also made public a file of previously unreleased evidence, including Cooper's plane ticket, composite sketches, fact sheets, and posted a request for information about Cooper's identification. Using electron microscopy, the CRT identified glycopodium spores, the source of which were likely pharmaceutical. The team also found particles of titanium, bismuth, antimony, strontium sulfide, aluminum, and cesium. The metal and rare earth particles suggest Cooper may have worked for Boeing or another aeronautical engineering firm at a chemical manufacturing plant or a metal fabrication and production facility. FBI agents found two hair samples in Cooper's seat, a single strand of limb hair on the seat and a single strand of brown Caucasian head hair on the headrest. The limb hair was destroyed after the FBI crime laboratory determined the samples lacked enough unique microscopic characteristics to be useful. The FBI crime laboratory determined the head hair was suitable for future comparison and preserved the hair on a microscope slide. During the attempts to build at Cooper's DNA profile in 2002, the FBI discovered his hair sample had been lost. In the armrest ashtray of seat 18E, 
FBI agents found eight Raleigh filter tipped cigarettes. These were sent to the FBI crime laboratory to search for fingerprints, but the investigators were unable to find fingerprints and returned the butts to the Las Vegas field office. In 1998, the FBI sought to extract DNA from the cigarette butts but discovered the cigarette butts had been destroyed while in custody of the Las Vegas field office. On February 10th, 1980, eight-year-old Brian Ingram was vacationing with his family in the Columbia River at a beachfront known as Tina Bar or Tena Bar, about nine miles downstream from Vancouver, Washington. The break in the nine-year-old investigation came Sunday when Dwayne and Patricia Ingram's eight-year-old son overturned some sand while walking the shoreline of the Columbia River near Vancouver, Washington, and the FBI confirmed it. It was indeed several thousand of the $200,000 that bailed out with D.B. Cooper on the eve of Thanksgiving back in 1971. As the boy raked the sandy riverbank back to build a campfire, he then uncovered three packets of ransom money, totaling around $5,800. The bills had disintegrated from their lengthy exposure to the elements, but were still bundled in rubber bands. FBI technicians confirmed that the money was indeed a portion of the ransom. Two packets of $120 bills and a third packet of 90 all arranged in the same order as it was given to Cooper. This discovery skyrocketed interest in the Cooper case. Statements by investigators and scientific consultants were founded on the assumption the bunched bills washed freely into the Columbia River from one of its many connecting tributaries. FBI agents scoured the area of the Ingram's find. At one point, a geologist was called in to determine whether money might be buried below the surface level in dredge material deposited on the beach in 1974. Searching in the sand on a deserted Columbia beach, finding bits of money along the high water mark. That's what's changed the whole myth of a man named Dan Cooper. People thought he landed on the west side of the range, but his money was found to be on the east side. That's how it drifted downriver. And now that's what's changing the whole search and the whole story of D.B. Cooper. An Army Corps of Engineer hydrologist noted the bills had disintegrated in a rounded fashion they were more matted together. It indicated that they had been disposed by the river's actions as opposed to having been deliberately buried. The conclusion, if correct, supported the hypothesis that Cooper had not landed near Lake Merwin nor any tributary of the Lewis River, which feeds into the Columbia River, well downstream from Tina Bar. This also lent credence to the supplemental speculation. The drop zone was near the Washington River, which merges with the Columbia upstream from the Discovery site. Although this does not explain the 10 bills missing from one packet, nor was there an explanation for how three packets would have remained together after separating from the rest of the money. Physical evidence was incompatible with geological evidence. Geological evidence suggests the bills arrived at Tina Bar after 1974. The year of a Corps of Engineer dredging operation on that stretch of river. Leonard Palmer, geologist, found two layers of sand and sediment between the clay deposited on the riverbank by the dredge and the sand layer in which the bills were buried, indicating the bills arrived long after the dredging had been completed. In 2020, analysis of diatomes found on the bills suggest that the bundles found at Tina Bar were not submerged in the river or buried dry at the time of the hijacking on November 1971. Only diatoms that bloomed during springtime were found, placing the date range that the money entered the water at least several months after the hijacking. In 1986, after protracted negotiations, the recovered bills were divided equally between Brian Ingram and Northwest Orient's insurer. Royal Globe Insurance. Who found it? Uh, well, my son and I found it together. I was getting ready to drop the wood and he cleared out the spot and rolled the money over on top of the sand. The FBI retained 14 examples as evidence. 
Ingram sold 15 of his bills at auction in 2008 for around $37,000. The Columbia River ransom money remains the only confirmed physical evidence from the hijacking found outside the aircraft. During the hijacking, Cooper demanded and received two main chutes and two reserve chutes. The two reserve chutes were described as emergency bailout chutes as opposed to sporting parachutes that skydivers would use. The two main parachutes were described as being like military parachutes because they were rigged to open immediately upon the ripcord being pulled and were incapable of being steered. When the FBI entered the plane in Reno, they discovered the two parachutes that Cooper left behind, one reserve and one main. The reserve parachute had been opened and three shroud lines had been cut out, but the main parachute was left behind intact. The unused main parachute was described as a Model 9B6, Navy Backpack 6, and is on display at the Washington State Historical Society Museum. In November 1978, a deer hunter found a 727's instruction placard for lowering the aft air stair. The placard was found near a logging road about 13 miles east of Castle Rock, Washington, north of Lake Merwin, but within Flight 305's basic flight path. Despite the initiation of federal sky marshals the previous year, 31 hijackings were committed in U.S. airspace in 1972, 19 of them with the purpose of extorting money, and 15 of the extortion cases the hijackers also demanded parachutes. In 1973, the FFA began requiring airlines to search all passengers and their bags. In July 2016, the FBI officially suspended active investigation of the Northwest hijacking case. Although reporters, enthusiastic professional investigators, and amateur sleuths continue to pursue numerous theories for Cooper's identity, success, and fate. There have been numerous theories and a large number of suspects and deathbed confessions in the D.B. Cooper case. I want to thank everybody for watching the video. There is an extreme amount of information about the D.B. Cooper case. I hope you enjoyed and we will see you on the next. Peace.